Hey everybody, how you doing? Teching and Barry back again, and today, ladies and gentlemen, is a very special day indeed. Not just because of anything related to the video itself, although we are having frog facts at the end, so, you know, make sure to stay tuned for that, but no, today is February 22nd, 2022. 2 22 and if you're not American and this bothers you, don't worry, I planned ahead. 22 2 22, which actually does make more sense now that I think about it, because it goes day, month, year, instead of the way we write it, which is month, day, year. I never understood that. By the way, the point is, there's a lot of twos. It's also a Tuesday, and I'm going to try my hardest to get this video out at 2.22 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In fact, it's only 12.22 right now, so i got to hurry this up, okay? But anyway, I would like to dedicate this video to you. 200 years from now, the next time we could actually make this uh, interesting comparison. So, yeah, okay. But anyway, today's video, um, so I don't know if you guys knew this, uh, it was a little bit debatable for a while, but Jinbei has joined the Straw Hat crew! He's finally there, palling around with everybody. So, because way back when I started doing One Piece content on this channel, I did discussion videos for every single Straw Hat, and those were a lot of fun to make, by the way, just going through the Straw Hats, making entire videos on them, sometimes they were over an hour long, I think Luffy's was a two-parter that was over two hours long. But anyway, because Jinbei joined, obviously people are asking, Asking me, hey, are you going to do a discussion video just all about Jinbei? And of course the answer is yes. However, there's a little bit of a caveat to this. In order to unlock Jinbei's video, I have to make a video about two other characters in One Piece first. First up is going to be the topic of today's video, Fisher Tiger, the original captain of the Sun Crew. And then the second video is going to be about Queen Otohime. Now these two figures were very integral in shaping who Jinbei is as a person, as a character in One Piece, okay? From when he was a kid, from when he started as the Ammo Knights under Neptune, from when he became a pirate under Fisher Tiger, to when he became the captain of the Sun Pirates after Fisher Tiger died, all the way up to becoming a member of Big Mom's crew, and then eventually the helmsman of the Straw Hat Pirates. You cannot look at Jinbei's character without looking at Otohime and Fisher Tiger as the two most important figures in his life. Fisher Tiger and Otohime sort of occupy this sense of duality. Uh, there's a lot of ideas of racism involved in One Piece, of course, the whole concept of Fishman and merfolk living together with human beings is something that Oda tackles quite a bit. And I honestly like the idea that Oda, it's not just one of these things where it's like it's solved in a single arc, you know, where it's like we encounter Arlong and his pirates back in the East Blue, and they're defeated, and the idea is like, okay, we defeated um, the evil monsters that have ruled over the East Blue that hated humans. Okay, now we can move forward. Oh, no, 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 no. Oda is not done telling this story, okay? Arlong, yeah, he had some really evil and intentions on what he was going to do with the humans living in Kokoyashi Village, and he had some evil plans for the East Blue in general, but he didn't just start out like that. There is a story involved here, and that story goes back over a decade to Fishman Island, okay, where we had Otohime and Fisher Tiger as very influential figures on the island. Fisher Tiger uh, basically ruled over the Fishman District. There was a little bit of a flashback we saw where he essentially fought all the other strong members of the Fishman District, uh, Jinbei included, Arlong was also there, Hotshon and everybody, and he kind of defeated them all, and he sort of raised up his fist, and he's just like, if anyone else can come to challenge me, I welcome your challenge. If there are no challengers, then I, Fisher Tiger, officially declare, you know, the Fishman District my territory, and I'll make sure to protect every Fishman with my very life. And everybody just kind of rose up and looked to him as like a big brother sort of figure, and it was like, yeah, we will follow you wherever, Brother Ty. That was like his nickname, Brother Ty, Tiger. Also, the idea of Ty Tiger being an enemy of a dragon in Japanese lore. Wonder if that's going to tie into anything. Of course it is because it's One Piece, okay? So Fisher Tiger was the ruler of the Fishman District. Meanwhile, we have Queen Otohime, who is, of course, the queen of the entire island of the Ryugu Kingdom, along with Neptune, her husband, okay? And when it came to her, of course, she was all about humans and fishmen and merfolk all living together under the same sun in perfect unity, okay? And so she preached that message to anybody that would listen. Sometimes she forced people to listen to that message like you will sign this petition and you will like it damn it because this is for the history this is for the future and so people are like oh queen otohime we love you but uh, i don't know about that right so, th so that was otohime and of course we'll get more into her when i make that video but for right now let's talk about fisher tiger now his viewpoints were pretty much the complete opposite of otohime's fisher tiger believed and this was before he became a slave this was before he went and got captured by the world government or anything he believed 
humans and fishmen and merfolk should remain separate, okay? And this could go back to the idea that for a long time, humans considered uh, fishmen to just be fish, so they didn't even, like, address the fact that they were sentient or autonomous or whatever, or intelligent life forms. It was literally just, like, the world government declaring them as fish up until about 200 years ago, which I believe there is a story there as well that Oda will tell at some point um, back in this dark era where they didn't have any rights at all, right? So, and, and eventually they were declared as, like, actually having rights by the world government. So nice of them to do that, and they were accepted at Reverie, but that doesn't change the fact for like 700 years ever since the world government took over, they were basically looked at as nothing more than just animals, okay? And so it was because of those reasons and probably a few dozen more that Fisher Tiger decided, you know what, I think we should just be kept separate, you know, from the humans because they do all these horrible things, we don't need to live in their world, we have Fishman Island and this is just, this is where we're going to live and raise our children and everything like that. Uh, Jinbei definitely definitely sided more with Fisher Tiger in terms of ideology at this point in his life, okay? It was sort of a thing where a lot of fishermen and merfolk, you know, they did want to live on the surface. They did want to live under the sun. Of course they did. They didn't, you know, want to live under the ocean their entire lives, right? And that was like a big theme of the Fishman Island arc. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, but the way humans treat fishermen is so deplorable, and humans have the world government, you know, complete control over the surface, essentially. So it was a very hesitant kind of thing in order to, like, sign Otohime's petitions and stuff. Because at the end of the day, I would imagine a lot of fishmen, not every single one, like, you know, Arlong, for instance, like, hated humans pretty much from the get-go, um, you know, but the idea was like, okay, we would want to live on the surface, but we just can't with the way the world government is, with the way the celestial dragons treat us with slavery and everything, it's just not going to happen, okay? So it's probably best for us to just stay in Fishman Island, right? So that's basically the setup for this, okay? And also, by the way, at the same time this is going on, Hody and all of his, you know, the, what eventually would become the new Fishman pirates, you know, um, like uh, Zeo and uh, Icarus and everybody, they're all living as children in the Fishman district. And so Arlong, Jinbei, Fisher Tiger, those are like their heroes growing up, okay? That's just brilliant what Oda does here, where it's just like, okay, we have Arlong who pretty much hated humans from the get-go, and then we have Fisher Tiger and his journey that we'll get to in a minute here, and then we have Jinbei kind of like, you know, crossed between deciding on like Otohime's viewpoints and Fisher Tiger's viewpoints, and he's sort of like unbalanced on where he wants to stand, and it's just like... Man, the way that Oda handles the topic of racism in this story, to me, is is just so nuanced. It, it ties back into historical events, it ties back into current events, right? And it, he handles it from all these different generations, like the way that an older generation handles racism, the way that it influences the younger generation, the way that, like, the younger generation will reject that racism. It's just, it's so nuanced, it's so deep. Just go read One Piece if you haven't already. And if you have read it, go back and read it again. It's pretty solid, right? Okay. Okay, so, Fisher Tiger was also known as an adventurer, all right, and he, not a pirate, keep in mind, very important, not a pirate at the beginning, he was just an adventurer, he was a protector of the Fishman District, and he would go out to the world and travel, and honestly, probably to, like, broaden his horizons, okay, he did not follow in the same, like, line as Arlong, where he just had a blind hatred for humans, uh, or Horty, where it's like, you know, humans never did anything to me personally, it's just, I've heard stories, and, you know, the way that it happened with, you know, the people before me, so that's why I just hated it, you get the impression with Fisher Tiger, he's like, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to see what's really out there in the world. I'm going to see and encounter humans with my own eyes and, um, you know, sit with them, eat with them, drink with them, and just see how the world really is, okay? Almost kind of like the way Dracula was in Castlevania, you know, like, like traveling the world. Like Lisa told him, you should travel the world. You should see people, you know? And so you kind of get that impression from Tiger a little bit in his youth where he's like, okay, I believe humans and fishermen and merfolk should remain separate, um, but I, I, I want to travel to see what's going on on the surface, right? So he would do that. And the, the implication was he traveled quite a bit, right? He was known as an adventurer and highly respected, right? And so one day, though, Fisher Tiger leaves to go on an adventure just to travel the world, and he doesn't come back for several years. We don't know how long, but it was many years. By the time, like, longer than any other um, adventure, any other, uh, you know, outing that he ever took, right? So eventually he comes back to Fishman Island one day. He just shows up wearing an awesome 
awesome shirt that has, you know, frog? No, hippo! And so that ties back into frog facts that we're going to be opening up today, right? Whatever. So he shows back up on the island. Jinbei meets him. Arlong meets him. He's like, you know, big brother Ty, how have you been? You know, oh, it's been so many years. And Fisher Tiger's just like, oh, yes, it's nice to see all of you. I'm glad you're all doing well and everything like that. And he doesn't tell them anything about what happened. He's just like, oh, I was on a long adventure. You know how it is. A lot of crazy stuff happened, right? So he goes to meet with Neptune and Otohime at the Ryugu Palace. And uh, they are the only ones that he tells, like, what actually happened to him while he was gone. You know, why he was gone for so many years. And the revelation is that, well, basically what Neptune says, he's like, hey, uh, what did you learn on the surface? And this line from Fisher Tiger, holy shit, cuts deeper than pretty much any other thing that you've heard in One Piece. He says, human nature. I learned about human nature. Holy shit, Oda. Okay, so... Fisher Tiger was captured at some point. We don't know the whole story behind how he's captured or whatever, but he was captured by the world nobles. Okay, and he was taken to Marijuana as a slave, just like all the other fishmen, all the other humans, whoever gets captured by the world nobles, they become just slaves. Okay, and he had to live that life for years. Once again, we don't know how long, but years long enough. You know, a day is long enough. An hour is long enough. Okay, so he was captured at Marijuana, tortured, humiliated on a daily basis. Finally, he managed to break free. And we also don't know the whole story about how he managed to break free. I imagine he just managed to get off of his shackles and then just jump over the edge of the red line off of Marijua. And he's really strong as a fisherman, so he managed to scale down the red line, reach the ocean, and just dive back down to Fishman Island, okay, after recovering from his wounds and all that stuff. Because by the time he arrived back on Fishman Island, he did not want anyone to know he was a slave. Okay, he didn't want anyone to know that, all right? So he, like, went away to somewhere else, he healed for a few months probably, got a new set of clothing, and then went back to Fishman Island and just treated it like, oh, I was just on an adventure, you know, how, how it is, right? And so he told Neptune and Otohime this. Otohime begins to openly weep um, because of what he said, but also because Otohime has finally specked observation hockey to the point she's basically an empath, so she can sense the emotions of other people. So with Fisher Tiger there admitting that he was a slave to the Celestial Dragons and all these memories came flooding into him, Otohime could sense all of that as well, so she began to weep for him, and Neptune was just like, oh my god. And so Tiger said to Neptune, he's like, listen, King Neptune, um, I left Marijua, um, but I, I, I left alone. There were so many other slaves there, uh, not just fishermen and merfolk, but other humans. There was so much suffering in that place. I feel genuine regret and guilt for not trying to save them, for just leaving alone, you know, escaping by myself. I need to go back to Marijua. I need to go, and I need to save them. I need to do as much good as I can. I need to free as many slaves as I can. Now, Neptune obviously would be okay with that, other than the fact that, like, with the situation with the world government, it's like, well, just calm down, Tiger, because if you do that, then that's actually what you're doing. You might seem as good at first, freeing a bunch of slaves, but if you were to do that then that would also seriously damage the government's relationship to the Ryugu Kingdom and Fishman Island as a whole. They may retaliate. They may go back to the old ways of not even declaring us as, like, you know, thinking beings anymore, right? Like, the side effects of this may be immense, but at the same time, Neptune and Otohime didn't really try to stop Tiger. They kind of just warned him about, don't do something rash, kind of, like, think about this first, but due to the nature of the way that humans treat fishmen, Neptune's not going to physically stop him or anything like that. No way. Okay, and so Tiger just kind of like left the throne room and Neptune was like, oh, uh, he does what he does. You know what I mean? And so the following year, after one year of being freed from being a slave at Marijua, um, he scaled the red line by himself with his bare hands, which, by the way, is one of my favorite feats in all of One Piece. There's probably a lot more out there, but I have three favorite feats that come to mind immediately when I think of badass characters like Fisher Tiger in One Piece, okay? The first one is Whitebeard punching the air so damn hard he creates a tsunami at Marineford. The second is Aokiji freezing the entire ocean 
and like not a big deal. And the third is Fisher Tiger scaling the entire sheer red rock wall of the red line with his bare hands, raising Marie Joie to the ground in fire and freeing as many slaves as he can and getting away in the process. That's a flex, right? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so he scales the red line, which once again, we don't know how tall the red line is from sea level all the way to Marijois. I like to think that it's not 7,000 meters because that's when you got, get into the White Sea. So that's like might, might, you know, have problems with the sky races and Marijois. So I like to think it's a little lower than that. So like five to 6,000 meters up. So literally, you got to imagine this. I want you to picture Fisher Tiger when he decided to do this. Okay, he left Neptune and Otohime and, you know, he thought about it maybe for a little bit. He's like, maybe I shouldn't do this because this is like declaring world on in the entire world essentially the government right and it might come back to hurt uh, Fishman Island but he's like I just can't leave those poor poor people just to suffer at the hands like I did at the world nobles I can't so Fisher Tiger he doesn't tell anybody about this by the way he doesn't tell Jean Bay he doesn't tell Arlong he doesn't tell any of his friends in the Fishman district Fisher Tiger heads back home he gets armed up you know he gets swords guns whatever he can get and he just kind of leaves Fishman Island, and he's just like, all right, let's do this. And you can imagine, he just, in one fell swoop, okay, he's 10,000 meters down from Marijois. From Marijois all the way down to Fishman Island, that is 10,000 meters. He walks out of Fishman Island, he jets up to the surface, wicked fast, breaks out of the water, lands on the red line, begins to scale that son of a gun, and just like, I'm, I'm gonna do it, right? But he reaches the top of the red line, gets into Marijois, starts burning the place down, freeing as many slaves, you know, you're like, to freedom, go! And they just try to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible, included in these slaves that uh, he freed, at least that we know of, of course, Boa Hancock, Sanderzonia, and Marigold, uh, that were captured by the world government at a young age. They were teenagers by the time they finally managed to escape, um, as well as Koala, who will come into play with um, Fisher Tiger and the Sun Pirate story a little later. Actually, very interesting if the Straw Hats at some point do run across former slaves that were freed by Tiger, and now because Jinbei is on the Straw Hats crew, that would actually be a really interesting dynamic. Like, the Straw Hats go to some island or whatever, maybe they go to Elbath, and maybe because there were giants that were sold at the auction house, they run into a giant that was a former slave, and he's just like, I have so much to thank for Tiger and Jinbei for you to save us, you know, and everything like that. So that'd be actually really interesting if the Straw Hats ran into somebody that was, like, freed by Tiger in the future. Anyway, he saves as many slaves as he can. He can't save all of them, of course, but he saves as many as he can. And he gives the government a, a serious wound in the process because this has never happened before. No one has ever scaled the rock wall of the red line, gotten up, and then burned Marijuana. He didn't burn the whole city to the ground, um, you know, and they probably repaired it fairly quickly. But he, he dealt them a serious blow. And to this day, he is the only person that has dealt that much damage. He is the person that has dealt the most damage to the government in terms of like the structure of Marijua actually getting into their city and burning it down and doing as much damage as possible and freeing as many slaves as he can. He's the only person that has ever done that, right? Fisher Tiger manages to escape in the process too. He doesn't get captured again or shot or anything. He manages to free all these slaves and escape off of the red line with all of these slaves in tow, okay? Now, he can't save all of them in terms of like getting them back to their home islands and stuff. Um, you know, he basically just gave them a fighting chance. Uh, it was stated that uh, Boa and her sisters were basically like hiding in the rock caverns of the red line. Eventually, um, uh, not uh, uh, Gloriosa, I was going to say Marigold, Gloriosa, who was the former empress of Am Amazon Lily, uh, you know, Grandma Neon, she's the one that found them and brought them back to Amazon Lily, okay? So, yeah, and then, of course, there were a bunch of other slaves that were just scattered all over the world, like Koala, for instance. A lot of them, you know, they were not families, but they were just like, okay, you're, you're coming with us, right? We're not family, but we are now, essentially, right? So... Uh, Fisher Tiger, he gets back down to Fishman Island after this, however, the problem is he cannot stay there because of what he did, and everybody knows, like, the government knows who he is now and what he did and everything like that, so he can't stay on Fishman Island anymore. And Neptune and Otohime, they're, like, lamenting what he did, kind of, like, oh my god, this is, I don't even know how to begin to fix this. We're not going to be invited back to Reverie for several years now. Um, but Neptune and Otohime, at the same time, they acknowledge, like, it's not like we tried to stop him. And they're, of course, like, well, of course we didn't try to stop him. He, we know that he was doing the right thing. So we have to deal with the fallout, but 
it's it's worth it. You know what I mean? He he did the right thing. He freed these slaves. So after this, Fisher Tiger tells the whole story. And this is a story that everybody knows in the entire world, right? Like the newspaper articles talk about this. Everybody on Fishman Island learns about this. Um, so basically, Fisher Tiger does not tell any of his crew that he used to be a slave right up until he dies. That's when he finally tells them. But he doesn't tell them about that. But he tells them, like, oh, I just, I couldn't stand the injustice anymore. So I scaled the red line and freed the slaves, you know? And so all of the fishmen and the merfolk are kind of rallying behind Fisher Tiger a lot more than they are Otohime. If anything, this makes them doubt Otohime's message even more, okay? But they follow Fisher Tiger because, you know, he's getting results here, right? And so it also speaks to a lot of what the fishermen wanted to do up until that point, you know, free the slaves, right? And that's Fisher Tiger did that, right? He did the impossible. So Tiger starts the Sun Pirates, the Pirates of the Sun that will sail under the same sun as humans. And he's also a shipwright and an accomplished carpenter, so he builds the Snapperhead, which is the flagship of the Sun Pirates ship that was one that was destroyed during Totland. There's a little bit of a discrepancy involving the Snapperhead. I'll get to it in a moment. But uh, at any rate, he builds the ship. Uh, Arlong, Hachan, Macro, uh, Jinbei, of course, uh, a lot of other members, you know, uh, like Karubi and Chu, uh, members that would eventually become part of the Macro Pirates and the Arlong Pirates, um, all join up originally on the Sun Pirates. That is also so incredible that Oda sets this up so early on in the East, where it's like that you have the fragments of the Sun crew that split off after Tiger died that started their own crews. And so Arlong headed up his own crew in the East with Karubi, Chu, Hachan. Sean Macro started his own crew at one point, and then Jinbei went back to Fishman Island and became like the boss of the Fishman District and everything like that. It's just, Oda sets this up so early on, even way back during East Blue. Fun fact, did you know after Mihawk, Jinbei was the first member of the Warlords to be mentioned. So he was the second member of the Warlords to be mentioned, but he was the last one to be properly introduced. It's like, Oda sets this stuff up, and he's like, you know, it's going to be a long time until I get back to it, but he does eventually get back to it. Same thing with Amazon Lily, when uh, Boa is explaining the history of her and her sisters being slaves at Marie Juan, how they escaped to Luffy way back during Amazon Lily, she's talking about Fisher Tiger. And we see like silhouettes of him. And yeah, his design changed a little bit through the silhouettes until he was properly introduced. But still, Amazon Lily, then Impel Down, and then Marine Ford, and then the time skip, and then, you know, Return to Sabote, finally getting to Fishman Island and finally addressing this story. Takes a long time, but Oda eventually circles back to all of the foreshadowing for the most part, right? So, um,. The creed on Tiger's ship, on the Sun Pirates, is that they are not killers. They are pirates by necessity because the government has declared them as criminals. They cannot stay on Fishman Island. That will cause more trouble for the citizens, okay? So for that reason, they are pirates. They will, you know, plunder and steal treasure and food and supplies, but they do not kill. That was one thing that Tiger declared first thing on the ship. He's just like, we do not kill humans on this ship. That is just starts the vicious circle up again, you know? We take vengeance on them. They take vengeance on us. And it just continues back and forth. And we, do, we are better than that. We are better than them. We will not succumb to that level of revenge and hatred and pain and, and, and just create this circle in perpetuity. All right? We will be better than that. Okay? We will fight when we are attacked. We will defend ourselves. We will free as many slaves along the way. And this is also the moment where he takes out the brand of the Sun Crew and all of the uh, pirates, all of the Sun Crew take that emblem upon themselves. Okay? Even the ones that weren't slaves originally. Because Arlong was not originally a slave. But the ones that were freed and that were slaves take that image as like an act of solidarity. So they're all together. You know? So they cannot be identified as a slave or whatever, right? Because of the mark of the celestial dragon is covered up, okay? So obviously at the same time this is going on, the world government, you know, is after them, all right? They're sending rear admirals. They are sending, you know, Kadar, who was a rear admiral. They sent Strawberry, who was a rear admiral. Eventually Kizaru, who was a vice admiral at this time. They are sending very heavy hitters against the Sun Pirates and Fisher Tiger for what he did. Okay, and Fisher Tiger fights back against all of them without killing any of them in the process. He does not kill them. In the meantime, though, we have Jinbei and Arlong that are a lot more rough and do end up killing a few people. I don't know if Jinbei killed any, but we know for a fact Arlong did. There was like a moment where, uh, uh no, not Vice Admiral, Rear Admiral Kadar attacks them. And so Tiger takes out Kadar himself. Jinbei has a moment where he's fighting against one of the Marines, and uh, one of the Marines calls him like a filthy fishman, and Jinbei's like, you... you 
want to say that again to my face and then he like punches him through a wall he might have died but there was a moment where one of the marines he was like a low ranking member too he was like a seaman recruit or whatever he's running out on the deck and he's terrified Arlong walks out with that giant sawtooth sword he has and he just looks at him and he's like oh please no and then Arlong just kills him right very very brutal and uh Tiger actually has to call him, call them into his office and have a moment with Jinbei and Arlong. Like, listen, guys, you know, you're way too, you're, you're going way too far with this, right? You can't be going around slaughtering them like this, right? And so Arlong is just like, why not? You know, all the stuff they do to us, all the stuff that they've done, they've turned us into slaves, you know, brother Tiger. You know, that is literally what they've been doing to us. And Fisher Tiger says the same thing. He's just like, listen, we, we can't you know, just more violence begets more violence. And Arlong's rebuttal to that is just, not if we kill them all. Like, Arlong straight up says that. Not if we kill them all. If we kill them all, then, and we and strike absolute terror into their children, they would never think of rising against us. You know, that's where Arlong's mentality really shone through at that point. The mentality that they are stronger than humans, you know, they're ten times stronger than humans on average. So it's just like, we're we're better than them, just by our nature, right? And so Fisher Tiger was just like, Arlong, I just, just, you can't. You can't kill them, okay? Not on my ship, right? But this is the moment where you think, hey, Fisher Tiger is like a beacon of hope here. And he is. But there's this idea that Fisher Tiger is just super altruistic here and he's like only for the greater good not getting his own emotions involved here in the process that's not true fisher tiger is such a well-written character in this regard later that night after arlong and fisher tiger have this argument tiger's out on the deck of the ship in the moonlight it's a very it's a very nice scene uh drinking jinbei walks out and fisher tiger's like oh is that you jinbei and Jinbei's like, look, you know, I'm sorry about Arlong. I'm also sorry about, you know, going a little bit rough with the humans and everything like that. Um, you know, and Fisher Tiger kind of has a moment where he's like drinking rum or whatever. And he's like, you know, Otohime is right. Like, we know this, right? Like, to the idea of a peaceful resolution to this. The idea that eventually, through Otohime's wishes and her actions, we could live in peace with the humans. So Fisher Tiger admits this. He's like, Otohime does have the right idea. And in her mind, I'm the same as Arlong. Like, there's no difference, because we're out here fighting humans. You know, this is not the right way to do this. And Tiger ends this conversation by saying, the thing I fear the most is what lurks in my own mind. Tiger was a slave for years. After he got away, and after he freed all the other slaves, and now he's doing good, going around and, you know, fighting the Marines and saving slaves in the process, he wants to take that altruistic path. He wants to take the path of, I'm not going to be about hatred, I'm not going to be about vengeance, I'm going to be the beacon of hope here. But... It's really, really hard when I was a slave and tortured and humiliated and all the worst possible things you can imagine, probably to the point where Fisher Tiger wished for death to take him. He knows he's trying to, you know, keep to his principles and stuff. He knows that violence and murder and slaughter is not the right path, but... He can't get it out of his mind. He can't just discard it. He can't say, like, well, violence is never the answer. Time to move on. No, he lived through it, for God's sake. And he's trying his utmost to do the right thing. But when he's out there on the deck, you know, drinking his rum and Jinbei's talking to him, he's probably sitting there thinking, like, what Arlong said kind of makes sense to me. And that scares him. That scares the shit out of him. That Arlong, that's just this person that's just up front with it. Like, we should just kill all the humans, you know? To Fisher Tiger, he's like, I, I know what he's saying isn't the right course of action. It's insanity what he's saying. But I can kind of get it because of what I lived through. And once again, none of the other Sun Pirates know this at this point. None of them know that he was a slave at this point. 
So it is, he has like severe PTSD and he probably wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, like having dreams of just slaughtering the humans. And he wakes up and he's just like, oh my God, what am I becoming? You know? So next phase of his story, the last, the last uh, chapter of his book, so to speak. Um, they arrive at an island where there were some slaves that Fisher Tiger freed. So they left Marie Joie, they got away, and they set up shop on this island, and the Sun Pirates arrive there. And so they're all very thankful to Tiger, of course. However, there is a young girl with them named Koala, and uh, she was freed the same time all the other slaves were freed, and they took her because they, they, she didn't have her parents around, so they took her back to this island. Now, she remembers which island she was from, Fool Shout Island. It's in the Grand Line. They know where it is, but the former slaves had no real means of getting her to that island. You know, the Grand Line is very treacherous, very dangerous, and they are fugitives. They still have the mark of the Celestial Dragons on them, okay? So they're fugitives, so they can't leave. It's like we could end up getting destroyed by the weather or the government or the Marines could capture us, and that's even more terrifying to them. Like, they would rather probably die in a storm than being sent back to Marijua. So, like, we can't leave this island. So they ask the Sun Pirates if they could please take Koala back to her homeland, okay? So Koala is very terrified at first by Fisher Tiger and Arlong and Jean Bay and everybody. Um, but they agree to take her on their ship. And at first, Arlong even, like, strikes her, you know, because it's like, oh, she might be a child, but she's the same as all the other humans. She's going to grow up to hate us just like everyone else does. And uh, she's obviously very traumatized from her time being a slave, where all her friends were probably slaughtered just for slacking off or whatever. So Koala, at this point, it's, it's very tear-jerking. I just rewatched these episodes just for this video, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Because Koala, as we know her now, the way she is, looking back on how she was then when she was on the ground, basically just like, I'll clean the floor, please don't hurt me, you don't have to kill me if I clean good, right? And it's just like, holy shit, man. You know, that moment when Dragon uh, finally, you know, carries out his revolution. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's going to be a moment in the story. Okay, anyway. So Koala eventually warms up to the, uh, the, the uh, Sun Pirates. Uh, she begins to cry. Fisher Tiger has a moment where he's like, we're not like everybody else. We're not like the humans. We're not like, you know, the people that were uh, enslaving you at Marie He takes his gun, his flintlock, and he tosses it over the side of the ship. And he's like, we are not like them. We do not kill. And Koala's presence on this ship actually does to sway Fisher Tiger's perspective, calm those emotions that he had about humans, also helps Jean Bay along the way. They eat together. There's a moment here. This is adorable where uh, Koala builds a little snowman with Jean Bay. That That's really cute. Now, obviously, when it comes to Arlong and the people that are more aligned with his point of view, like Karubi and Chu, um, he doesn't warm up to Koala really ever. What happens next is the thing that kilters everything back to the other direction but had everything went okay with this had koala went back to her homeland and everything was okay and had fisher tiger went back to the ship and everything played out perfectly fine who knows maybe fisher tiger would have truly in his own mind it would have like finally settled those demons that he had inside of him maybe arlong would have not have hated humans as much jinbei would have become the person he is now earlier maybe well that's not what happened of course so they arrive at fool shout island um, at this point, by the way, uh, they gave koala a new set of clothes they even covered up the slave mark with the sun pirate symbol as well um, several months of travel they arrive back at her hometown uh, they dock on the shore, and uh, Fisher Tiger's like, okay, I'll, I'll walk you to the outskirts of your village at least, okay? And so Koala says her goodbyes and tears in her eyes, and she's crying like, thank you all! And she's, she leaves with Fisher Tiger. It's this really adorable moment where Fisher Tiger's like holding her hand, and he's kind of like, he doesn't really know how to deal with this because he's kind of like her dad in this situation. He's just like, oh, whatever. And so Koala's like, yeah, let's go back home. Come on! And so it's like, okay. And so they're walking into town. And uh, he stays on the outskirts. He kind of, like, just lets Koala go up to the townspeople herself. Uh, Koala's mother comes out and, you know, gets to see her daughter for the first time in years. And they hug. And it's kind of like you're waiting to see what's going to happen with this shit. All right? Because it's a scene actually very similar to the scene. And one of the most heart-wrenching episodes of Hunter Hunter, when Bloster brings um, uh, Chidori or uh, Rina back to the village in the NGL. And it's like this moment where it's like, okay, are they going to invite Bloster in? Are they going to accept 
or are they going to push him away? And uh, suffice to say, it's the exact opposite of what happens in Hunter x Hunter. So Tiger's off to the side, and you think, like, are they going to... Are they going to invite him into the village? He's like, oh, you saved Koala. It would be remarkable if that actually happened. If they'd never tipped off the Marines, if they welcomed Fisher Tiger with open arms, maybe if they welcomed all of the Sun Pirates. How, how amazing would that be, right? How much of a happy ending would that have been, right? For the people of the island to be like, oh, where are you going? You saved Koala. Come on, you and your crew. You can party with us tonight as a banquet. And Fisher Tiger's like, Okay, and then he's like, the whole crew comes over, Arlong is kind of sulking in the corner, but the rest of the fishmen, the rest of the sun pirates are like, yeah, they're having fun with humans, having a good time, and then Koala stays on the island, and they go back to the, the snapper head, and they sail off with, like, new hope and um, new uh, goals set to, like, you know, like, this is going to be the dawn of a new chapter, basically. We don't always get happy endings in One Piece. Oda is, at times, we do get happy endings in One Piece every now and then, but Oda is not above showing the cruel, harsh reality of what this world is. Things cannot be solved that quickly, and people are not just going to just do what you think they're going to do. Like, oh, they saved Koala, therefore they'll be nice. So the village elders, of course, tipped off the Marines that Fisher Tiger and the Sun Pirates were going to be arriving at their island. Uh, they got wind of this. The reason they did this was to save Koala, because Koala is still a slave. And so the Marines and the government basically promised them, okay, you tipped us off about the Sun Pirates, so we will arrive to bring them in. Uh, your daughter, Koala, she will not have to go back to Marijua. So you could kind of see the angle from the village elders, like, you know, okay, if they didn't do this, Koala would be living as a fugitive, and she would eventually, like, they would still be on the run, so you could sort of see it from that perspective, but still a very duplicitous thing to do. Um, I mean, I feel like at that point, they could have at least warned Fisher Tiger. You know, it was like, we had to tell the government, because if not, you know, they would have come after Koala, um, but the Marines are going to be you know, trying to bring you in. They could have at least warned him, but they didn't. It's such a sad scene because Tiger is walking back to the ship by himself, and he's just thinking to himself about everything that's happened with Koala and how he, you know, finally managed to, like, he achieved a victory here. He's just like, I, I took a slave and I returned her to her family. And, he, and uh, she thanked him as, like, she was the only one. As, as Fisher Tiger was walking away, Koala's like, thank you so much, Uncle Tiger. And then he just kind of waves at her and smiles. And he's like, you know, it's, it's one step at a time with this. It's just one step at a time. It's not going to happen at once. The village weren't accepting of me, but I did make a difference. And Koala, I, I bet Fisher Tiger was thinking of, like, okay, Koala is now going to tell the villagers about how we really are. And that'll make things at least a little better. And while he's in the middle of having these, like, optimistic views about the future and everything, he is surrounded by Marines and Strawberry as their commanding officer, guns and rifles pointed right at his face. At the same time, a fleet of Marine battleships arrives at the coast surrounding the snapper head, and Arlong and everybody immediately realizes we've been set up. You know, it, we, we try to do something right, and look what happened. It's always the same shit. So they're now in a fight for their lives. Jinbei goes to fight Strawberry. Really epic clash there. Tiger gets riddled full of bullets. He just gets completely pumped full of bullets. They eventually manage to steal one of the Marine uh, battleships and get everybody on board and sail away. This is the discrepancy involving the Snapperhead because I believe it was mentioned during Tautland when the Snapperhead was officially destroyed. It was burned by Oven. It was mentioned by them. Like, that was the ship we sailed on as the Sun Pirates. That was the ship that Brother Tiger built. And it was revealed later, like, here, like, they had to leave it behind, so I'm not really sure if they recovered it later, or if they, I don't really know how it worked, you know, there was a little bit of a discrepancy there, but whatever, that's not really important right now. What's important is, Fisher Tiger was betrayed, um, all these bullet wounds and everything, they, they stole a marine ship, and Aladdin is there, the doctor, who, by the way, is the current captain of the Sun Pirates, the Sun Pirate crew still continues to this day, and so Aladdin is there, and he's the doctor, and he's like, Okay, well, it's a good thing we stole this marine battleship because they have an infirmary. They have a sick bay. They have a bunch of cold storage. It's okay, Fisher Tiger. We're going to save you. And Tiger has to stop him. And he's like, wait a second. That blood that they would have here on this marine ship, that would be human blood. 
And Aladdin's like, yeah, it, it is, but it doesn't matter. You know, humans and fishmen and merfolk, we, we share the same blood. It's okay. You have a very rare blood type. We're, it's so lucky that they have the same blood type as you, okay? We can save you. And Fisher Tiger's like, no. I don't want an ounce. I don't want a drop of their blood, of their tainted blood, in my veins. And this is the moment, right on his deathbed, that he reveals to the rest of the Sun crew, I was a slave. And they all are just aghast at this. They can't believe it because of everything that he's done. And Jimbe, like the wheels click in Jimbe's head. He's like, now that, that moment he had with Fisher Tiger earlier with like, the only thing I fear is my own mind, what lurks in my own heart. It clicks with Jimbe right away. Like, oh my God, you know, you went through this horrible, this horrible stuff. Like the worst thing anybody could endure in this world, being a slave for years at Marijua. And despite that, you were all about saving people, all about not killing. It was the hardest thing probably ever for you. But even at the end, Fisher Tiger cannot bring himself to love humanity. He tried as hard as he could. He tried to stay, to his, uh, stay true to his principles. He tried to do the right thing. But at the end of the day, he admits, I could never get to that point. I could never achieve that. I could never reach... What Otohime, what Otohime does with like loving humans, I could not. I wanted to. I wanted to so bad. Put the past behind me and move on, and get to this point where I could be this beacon of hope. But I just couldn't do it. And all the other Sun Pirates are like, "No, you did do good. You are the beacon of hope. You saved so many slaves. You're to Koala and to the slaves on that other island. You know, you you are their savior. You are the beacon of hope." And at that moment, he smiles and he's like, "That's good then." And his last dying wish was never tell anyone, never tell anyone on Fishman Island um, about that I was a slave. I don't want them to know that ever. And so they're all crying, and then Tiger dies. So that's the last chapter in his life. But as I stated at the beginning of this, his legacy is something that permeates this story to this very day and will until the end of the One Piece manga. Because Fisher Tiger and Otohime's spirits live on in Jinbei. So the death of Tiger sets off a domino effect across, you know, a bunch of characters and groups and the series in general. Uh... Any hope that Arlong had about maybe discovering a little bit of uh, love for humanity, or at least, like, liking humanity, is completely shattered into a million pieces at this point. And Arlong leaves to go set up his crew. He first goes back to try to avenge Tiger by slaughtering everybody on the island. Kizaru finds him and brings Arlong in, so he's thrown into Impel Down. Um... The new Fishman Pirates, who would become the new Fishman Pirates, Horty and Zeo and everybody on, on uh, the island in the Fishman District, they right there cements their hatred for humanity. And they begin to grow up with the idea, like, we're going to start this crew and, you know, we're going to be the new Fishman Pirates, except we're going to go even more with it than even Arlong did. They basically look at Arlong as a role model. Um... Neptune and Otohime, uh, like I said, they did learn about this prior. And I think Jinbei also tells them in a letter as well, the, the nature of this. Um, and so Fishman relations with world government are hurt for several years. Uh, there's also Otohime's story that we'll get to in the second part of this. Uh, Jinbei, the following year, the next couple of years later, decides to become a warlord to try to improve relations a little bit. Um, because Jinbei took Fisher Tiger's words and his message more than Arlong did. Arlong was just like, Fisher Tiger, um, he, 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 I respected him, but he just didn't have the right perspective. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be the one that's going to change the world. And that was Arlong's perspective. So he goes to Kokoyashi and enslaves Nami's village and kills Belmere. Uh, Macro leaves and goes to, you know, create his own crew. Uh, but Jinbei kind of takes the message and he's like, and, and keep in mind though, at this point, Jinbei still does not love humans like Otohime does, and in that way kind of following in the same footsteps as Tiger, where it's like he knows the right thing to do, but it's really hard, you know, considering they killed uh, Tiger, his, like, his big brother figure, the person that he respected, right? So Jinbei decides to become a warlord to try to make the relations between the world government and Fishman Island a little bit better. 
uh, in Otohime's wishes. Uh, because Tiger told him this. He's like, Otohime, Jinbei, you have to remember this. Jinbei, Otohime's will is ultimately the correct one. Even though it's really hard on the journey, the end point that she's vying for is the correct one. And so maybe it's because of those words that he told Jinbei and his last wishes that Jinbei decided, I still don't like humans, but I have to do this. I have to, I have to slog through it. I have to fight to get to that point, to get to that world that Fisher Tiger and Otohime wanted. And of course, Otohime ends up dying as well. So, and so, of course, those are the events that lead Arlong to becoming the captain of the Fishman Pirates at Arlong Park. That's what leads Jinbei to being a warlord and uh, kind of sets everything in motion as long as with the new Fishman Pirates and everything in motion until the present storyline when the Straw Hats get involved. That's the circumstances that set up all of that. Um, that is backstory stuff I cannot even imagine how long it took Oda to think of. This, like, intricate thing that ties back into everything else. Of course, Koala is now um, one of the main characters of the Revolutionary Army, you know, so it's very fascinating to see the way that Koala grew up and what she decided to become uh, a revolutionary, you know, to save the world, to, you know, take down the world government. It, it's so great that, you know, Oda did not just introduce Koala as, like, this character just for Fisher Tiger's backstory and then, like, okay, she's never going to show up again. Like, no, the words and the will of Fisher Tiger are carried on through Koala and the revolutionaries in general with their ultimate goal. So... A little bit more of an intense video, certainly. But thanks for watching, everybody. Oh, we still have to do frog facts. Right, of course. Yes. Frog? No, hippo. I might do hippo facts for letter H, but whatever. Um, thanks for watching this video, though. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for the Otohime video. I'm not going to do it, like, right back to back. Uh, but I will do the Otohime video next. And then we're going to do um, Jinbei's character discussion after we finish with hers. Okay. All right, anyway. Uh, yes, time to start a new Animal Facts series. Uh, we got Frog Facts. And uh, this is great. Uh, this morning when I checked my email, I actually got an intro for this. Um, we have uh, Kazu uh, that created me an intro. So thanks to Kazu. I'll play it here in a second. I just also want to say that you're not required to make uh, intros for these. I don't want you because I'm going to go through the entire alphabet. Okay, it's going to be a while. And uh, some of these might only last a few weeks. So don't feel like you're like you have to make an intro for these. Although if you do make an intro for Animal Facts, I will use it. I won't say no to the intro, right? Because uh, it is, is really cool. But anyway, yeah, let's kick to it. Frog facts. Begging. Frog facts. Frog facts. Frog facts. All right, so let's start it off with some simple frog facts here. Frogs are amphibians. What? Frogs are amphibians? Since when? I didn't know this. Did you know this? What the fuck? Okay, no. So they're amphibians, uh, mostly carnivorous amphibians, and that is something, like, I knew they ate, like, bugs and flies and stuff, but I didn't actually know they were mainly carnivorous. I just assumed that they were more omni om omnivorous. They could consume, like, plants as well as, like, animals. Um, and there are a few species that are more omni omnivorous, um, omnivorous, whatever. Um, and then there's other species that are more just herbivores, that just do eat just plants and stuff. But the vast majority of frogs are, in fact, carnivorous. Um, they deviated off. They're very evolutionarily old. They deviated off from other amphibians about 265 million years ago. So they've been around for a very long time. Um, there are over 5,600 species of frogs. So we're going to be around here for a while. Also toads. Uh, this is something else. And I kind of knew this already. Frogs and toads taxonomically are pretty much the same. Uh, it's really more of just like a difference in terms of the way humans perceive them. Frogs typically are more like slimy and, you know, they're, they're like moist, you know, and like smooth. Whereas toads, you know, are more dry, you know, coarse kind of skin. And of course they have warts. But overall, there's really not. It's like it's not like toads are over here and, uh, fr and, uh, and frogs are over here. You know, they are pretty much the same uh, taxonomically speaking, right? Um, Let's see here. Uh, they lay their eggs in the water, which eventually hatch and become tadpoles. Uh, then they grow into becoming frogs themselves. Uh, they're extraordinarily efficient at turning food that they consume into their own body mass. Uh, better than pretty much any other uh, amphibian in that regard. Uh, when it comes to frogs that do have that uh, semi-permeable, very moist skin, they do tend to dry out very quickly, which is why a lot of them live in very uh, swampy environments, very near water for that reason. Uh, Kermit is a frog. 
Yeah, he's, he's certainly a frog. Yeah, Kermit the Frog. Um, and also we have a lot of frogs that secrete poison. And with that regard, I want to show you guys something interesting here. Um, this is a book that uh, one of my favorite books when I was a kid, when I was in elementary school. They had these uh, in the school library. I would uh, check them out all the time. Uh, the Scholastic Question and Answer series. Uh, this one is Do Tarantulas Have Teeth? But there's a bunch of other uh, books in this series. And as we see here, it's not just all about tarantulas. It's also about frogs and other things, snakes, uh, the Gila monster, bees. Like, I love this. This is like one of those books that really got me interested in like entomology and like insects and stuff growing up. Um, there we have a bumblebee, freaking yellow jacket. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, man. These, like, maybe you kids grew up with zoo books growing up. Yeah, I grew up with these. I had zoo books as well. But, man, look at that tarantula hawk. Just like, yeah. Oh, my God. But, oh, there's ants. There's there's a callback to ant facts right there. Uh, but here we do have, we have stuff about jellyfish. Uh, but here we go. Uh, we have toads as well as we have uh, poison dart frogs and, and such. And so a lot of these uh, things that I learned about, um, I learned in this book. Um, a lot of it might be out of outdated because this was published in, like, I think the year 2000. So it's a little old. 1999. So, yeah, this is the best. This is the height of 90s uh, biology knowledge uh, that was presented to uh, kids at book fairs in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm going to read a few of the frog facts from this book, actually, as we get more into it. But um, for that, that's the, just the first episode. Get excited. Uh, frog facts are going to continue. Yeah. Happy, uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. This will be teching. And Barry and Jean Bay signing out. Later, everyone.